Did you ever hear of a thing called the Nagda Nidalaga? No, what's that? It was the last will and testament of the Third Reich. Orders for the procedure after the defeat. When they saw the end coming, a few Nazis in high places were entrusted with the job of hiding the party's loot from the Allies. Instructions were to go underground until the occupation forces withdrew. After that, the booty was to be used for the reorganization of the Nazi party in Germany. The loot was gold, millions of dollars worth of it. Some of it was melted down from church vessels and objects of art, but most of it came from the hands and the mouths of victims of concentration camps. Wedding rings and metal work. This is the sort of booty the Nazi big shots were dealing in. We know there is an organization controlling the remaining treasure in Germany today. And we think the man behind it is the same man who directs the silhouette operation. Welcome back to BCFM's Politics Show with old Labour Oxford economist Martin Summers and me, Tony Gosling. Martin, we start with Syria and French troops. Uh, This is up in northern Syria, apparently uh, being used actually against uh, the Turks and supposedly in support of uh, the US, what they call the coalition in Syria. Well, I'd be interested to know. Obviously, I haven't heard anything about this this afternoon. The situation up in that part of the world is getting very, very complex because the Syrian army also sent people in to support the uh, YPG fighters against Turkey. Um, And this is also being used as an excuse for the Western powers to intervene. I mean, the, the, the Syrian government position has always been clear that all foreign forces should leave Syrian soil. Um, and of course, the, there was a, the Russian army was saying last week that they've captured the, the Syrians have captured a huge chemical weapons factory inside Idlib, which they were going to use as part of a false flag uh, chemical weapons attack, which was going to be blamed on Damascus and then lead to a, an air assault. Well, Euro on the, News uh, are reporting on a the, Kurdish uh, official was saying French President Emmanuel Macron is sending troops to Syria. Uh, so, but but Macron is denying it. He says, "Oh, uh, well, actually, well, we may not." Well, I'll be pretty. Cer- I'll be pretty certain that French special forces are in there anyway, just as they were in Libya. What's they'll, the be all o- they'll be all over it. What's the difference between the regular infantry soldiers and special forces? Well, the special there? forces are deniable. They just go in. I mean, don't forget, Syria used to be a French colony. They've been very supportive of the jihadis who are trying to overthrow Assad. They see it as their backyard, and that they should be, you know, that they should have some say in what goes on in Syria. And Macron is a, tr- you know, an inheritor of that imperial. Well, okay, in the Cade or say. Macron is saying, um, or one of his spokespeople, there will be reinforcements to help secure from attacks by Islamic State and stop a foreign aggression. Um, he says, referring to Turkey, it's message that this irresponsible action from the Islamists in Ankara stops. Now, they're calling the Ankara Islamists. All right, well, it may be that t- well, Turkey is one of the countries that hasn't expelled any Russian diplomats over this Skripal case. I mean, let's just and be that's clear because here. they're possibly changing sides. Let's be clear here. The YPG have been fighting so-called Islamic State alongside the US military, and it yeah. looks like the, the French are coming alongside that too. Can yeah. you just explain how that fits into the wider pattern in Syria? Well, I mean, don't forget there's also been uh, the, the, the YPG of also been talking to the Syrian government about what sort of th- you know what sort of support they could get from them, and there's been you know there's a th- sort of three or four way conversation going on now, and you can imagine Turkey's part of NATO. So, so are we talking about two sides? Or no, three so we're talking sides about more than two sides. sides. We're not talking about two sides. Two sides is simple stuff. Most wars don't have two sides. So you've got Islamic State. You've <laughs> people got Islamic people State. think that they know that there's only two you've sides in a war. It shows you don't on, know anything about warfare. You've got the Islamic State on the one side. You've got the YPG, the Americans, and the French on the other. Yeah, but the, but the the Islamic, yeah. So who? Well, the Islamic State was supported by NATO, the Turks, and the West as well. So at the same time, they're pretending to attack the Islamic State, although it was quite clear that at certain stages, Islamic State people withdrew, and Panorama covered this, withdrew, and were then redeployed uh, with the help of the, uh, you know, the embedded forces uh, of the U.S. Marines inside the YPG. Now, the YPG are supposedly independent, but seem to be working with the Americans. Meanwhile, they're trying to fight Turkey when the Turks regard them as terrorists, although NATO's, you know, Turkey's part of NATO. NATO still, uh, and so on. So it's getting very complicated. Most people don't really understand what's going on because they don't understand that the ISIS is essentially a creation Just going of to Saudis and the Western intelligence going services. To antiwar.com, um, looking at this whole situation, Trump is saying the US troops are leaving Syria very soon. Yeah, he came out with that the other day. Uh, although, quite how long very soon? That can be a long time, can't it? And American, troop is among, American troops are among uh, the dead in Syria bombing. This is an IED in Syria. Also, the 
French are to spend for, send special forces to uh, Manbij, uh, mm-hmm. the, the city. And Mattis is saying the US has nearly attacked the Russians in Syria again last week. Well, the Russians were saying exactly that. I mean, they were expecting a false flag chemical weapons attack in Syria, which would then lead to an air assault on their forces in Syria. And they were saying, if you, ta- if, you know, because they've been taking quite a lot of punishment in so-called accidental strikes on their forces, and said, if that happens again, we're going to sink the ships where the planes are, fi- where, where the missiles are fired from. So we've got right to the edge here. Very close to the edge. Has and that got script, anything, script, anything script. to do with this Skripal business? Well, I think it has. I mean, you've got to you've got to see all this. As, I mean, if you, there was actually an, uh, I actually glanced at this uh, um, uh, this document that's been produced by the British to justify their position, and it's got a, you know a, a pattern of Russian uh, um, evil, and it's got the, the, all these various so-called steps that the Russians have taken with the Skripal case as the sort of final straw that broke the camel's back. But most of it is frankly made up totally made up. I mean, there's the, the, the the no coverage in the West of this court case in Kiev, where it's been proven to the satisfaction of a court that the sniper fire that killed the 80 demonstrators and police officers at the beginning of the Maidan crisis was carried out by Western special forces orchestrated by NATO. That all came out in a court case in Kiev. Well, this, uh, and meanwhile, Her Majesty's we- Government, this is the document, we'll put a link up to it on our show page. It's called The Salisbury Incident, and it was issued by by the British Embassy yeah. in Moscow on the 22nd of March. Yeah. Uh, it does a kind of timeline of that particular incident. But the thing you're referring to is uh, is the slide four, which talks about a long pattern of Russian malign activity. Now, let's just run through some of this. <laughs> November the t- 2006, the assassination of Alexander Litvinenko. Well, I mean, Litvinenko, was, to my mind, was probably assassinated by Berezovsky as part of a pattern of trying to... And even the British inquiry said it was only probably the Russians that did that. Yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 you've got to... Re- Most people who don't follow this presume that it's getting too complicated. I mean, it's, you May know, it seems straightforward. Okay, Martin, we need to have some just quick answers from okay. you. May 2007, a denial-of-service attack disables Estonia's internet. Uh, I just don't believe that that happened. I mean, that's the sort of thing I'd say to that. Well, Why would the Russians want to do that? Uh, what good would it well, be? It's easy actually to mask a DDO. Well, it is, and we it? know that the so CIA can do. The, yeah, what they can, the, NSA the, 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 the CIA can you? mask it. Yeah, that's quite right. They uh, can they can do it and then claim it's the August Russians. August two thousand and eight, the invasion of Georgia. Well, what happened there is that the Georgians attacked the enclaves which were protected by the Russian army, and then they during they the, them during out. the opening <laughs> ceremony of the Chinese uh, Olympics. Yes, that's right. And the, uh, there was the the Georgians. Are, they got loads of Israeli personnel in there and British military personnel, etc. And they ca- um, mounted an unpro- unprovoked attack on Ossetia the and uh, February, Kradkazia. The February, the February, and the Russians were ready for them and gave them gave them a kicking. That's what happened. The February there. 2014 occupation of Crimea and the destabilisation of Ukraine. Well, that 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 all came from the original Maidan protests, where we now have court evidence from a court in Kiev that the suit shootings were carried out by NATO special forces, okay. specifically mercenaries from Georgia. Okay, then the 17th of July 2014, MH17 was shot down, killing all 283 Well, as BBC Russia pointed out at the time, they had eyewitness reports on the ground saying that the plane was shot down by a uh, an aircraft from Kiev. Uh, and that, that was put up on BBC Russia in Russia and, also and the, then taken down. And, but that's and, prima facie Andrew evidence Perubi, of that. who's the fascist uh, in, in uh, leader in uh, Sloboda and of the Maidan mm. protests, yeah. uh, he was the chair of the National Security Council at the time that plane was shot down. Yeah. Two weeks later, without any explanation, he was forced to resign. Yeah, well, I mean, I think what we need, what we're seeing is uh, the British government dredging all this stuff up no. shows that they haven't okay. actually got Martin, any evidence we haven't got on to the end up. of it yet. No, uh, no, I know. It's, it's, June twenty, it's a frog June of 2015 uh, to November twenty sixteen, interference in the U.S. elections. Uh, well, I think all the evidence suggests that the interference was no, was no inter- there was no interference by the Russians. The leak, the WikiLeaks leak about the emails showing that the Democratic primary had been rigged against Bernie Sanders came from WikiLeaks and not from Russia at all. In May 2015, the Russians attacked the Bundestag, uh, hacked into the Bundestag. Uh, well, the Russians would say no, we didn't. And of course, as you pointed out, it's quite possible for these cyber attacks to be faked as if they're from the Russians. Why would the Russians want to do something silly like that? What, were they, what was the goal? What well, would they be the want goal? to know what the Germans are up to. So well, they're going to hack in, aren't they? Well, if they're going to hack in, you hack in quietly. You don't leave a, leave a fingerprint saying we've hacked into your I computers. I think with all these hacking things, it's almost impossible to prove who's done it. Well, exactly. That's the problem here. Uh, January 2016, the Lisa case, disinformation against Germany. 
Well, I don't even know this case, but okay, I mean, Martin. you're the, the scraping well, bottom of the one. belt. OK, Martin, uh, we'll leave that one. The 2015 to 2016, the Danish Defence Ministry hack. We'll leave that one. It's another hack that can't be proved. October 2016, a coup attempt in Montenegro. Well, that's in fact the, the, the coup attempt was by the by, from the other side. I mean, this is it's the, there was a lot of interference going on in in in, in uh, pr- former Yugoslav politics. Well, by we the way. actually met uh, when I was on holiday there. The nephew of the pro independence presidential candidate who was uh, who was saying that we shouldn't either be aligned with NATO or Russia, and he was. He was actually uh, arrested on the middle of the day, of the election day, mm. by the police, and he's still on trial, apparently. Now, that is desta- the police so that's suppo- the election. So that's supposedly a coup attempt where the opposition po- candidate, who uh, is opposed to Montenegro being part of NATO, is arrested in the election campaign and accused of carrying out a coup. In actual fact, it's a coup by NATO against Montenegro. And then, of course, finally, March 2018, an assem- attempted assassination of Sergei and Yulia Skripal. Well, it's, uh, I think it's game, set and match, isn't it? We've got to go to war with Russia now. What else can we do? Well, what do you make of this? Because the news has come out that uh, Skripal had actually tried to contact Putin and said he was fed up with living in Britain and he wanted to go back. Now, MI6 wouldn't necessarily have liked that, would they? No, well, I would imagine that somebody like Skripal... I mean, people have got to get their heads around the idea that MI6 is not some kind of wonderful organisation that's out there help, protecting us from terrorism. Full of James Bond's. Yeah, but it is full of James Bonds, and you know that the Operation James Bond, Operation JB in World War II, was the was the uh, uh, operation to spring Martin Bormann from Berlin, as uh, and and of course uh, Ian Fleming was involved in that, which is why he called his hero James Bond. As uh, you know, as can be, you know, if people look at our archive, you'll find what that story is all about. MI6 is actually a very devious and ruthless organisation. We heard originally that compared that, to that, all sorts that this of uh, in evil things with Novichok was uh, nerve gas. That was the original, uh, the yeah. original. But it, apparently, it turns out, and it's funny because I was joking with a friend earlier this week, saying, "Well, this nerve agent could be anything. It could be jam," and he laughed. But uh, actually, it turns out apparently it was gel smeared onto his door handle. Yeah, it's funny that the police are taking so long to find that after you know it's only t- only twenty days later, uh, and it still doesn't prove anything. I mean, when they went to court to get the blood samples from the victims, they had to they, they, they had to submit a court document that says it was caused by Novichok or some similar agent, and that is because they haven't proved that it's Novichok, whatever Novichok is, or that it's related to the Russians, and that was leaked to Craig no. Murray, the uh, former U- the, U.S. ambassador, the British ambassador point, in the Russians have pointed out, and I'll point out that these nerve agents are incredibly toxic it might take right. you weeks and weeks to die of it but you nine times out of ten you're not going to survive well if they, uh, if they we've mean, also had remember 45 uh, uh, soldiers and sailors down at port and down just 10 minutes drive away from salisbury who, who died as a result of um, having been basically used as guinea pigs in port and down uh, yeah. and they were given this what three paltry three million compensation about 10 years ago the families mm. for that mm. uh, can we trust port and down can we trust the British government full stop? And the answer is no, because they're committed and dedicated to this whole psychological warfare trope that elections and the truth are all secondary to winning the war that they claim to be fighting. But of course, it means that they are liars and are shown to be liars. And in a court of law, their evidence would not be accepted on the basis that they've lied so often before. Well, let's have a little look at this thing called Operation Beluga now. Uh, And this is a recording that was done with a a former French GIGN officer. So can you just tell us who GIGN are? Well, as I understand, they're the anti-terrorist police in in uh, in France. Uh, and he's uh, he's retired, and his name is Paul Barrel. But he's got some quite interesting things to say about what he believes is a concerted attempt by the US through the CIA and the British through MI6 through our taxpayers' money to destabilise uh, the Russian secret state within Russia and also to uh, get rid of Putin. Uh, Captain, uh, Captain Barrel, you've said that you are going to make a statement about the unknown facts concerning the death of Alexander Litvinenko. Why did you decide to speak now? Because I think that now it is necessary to reveal the truth. After the death of Litvinenko, so many lies were told by journalists, but above all by the secret services. I especially want to make this clear. 
For America and Britain, the Cold War has not ended. The struggle continues. And in the Litvinenko case, we are talking about an operation to destabilize the Russian leadership, particularly President Putin, to seriously damage the reputation and credibility of the internal security forces. This manipulation operation is coordinated by the CIA and MI6 and all the enemies of Russia. France is also involved in this, backing up the Americans. You see that the Mistral was not delivered, that a financial investigation was initiated against Putin's inner circle. All of this is being done in order to destabilize Russia and cast a shadow on Putin's policies. This applies to Ukraine, but above all, to Syria. This secret operation of the Americans and the British, does it have a code name? The code name for this operation, which was assigned by the CIA, is Beluga. So this is the code name that was given by the Americans to this secret operation. This operation is like a painting, a watercolor, where each stroke, every touch of the brush has its own color. But in general, the whole picture has the same goal, to discredit and destabilize President Putin. It is necessary to clarify that I am a resident of London. I live there most of the time. I know London. In London live about 300,000 Russians, including a Chechen community. All Putin's opponents are in London. For for example, Bill Browder. Well, there we are. I mean, it, 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 the audience can make their own mind up about the credibility of that. Is that true? All Putin's opponents are in London? Well, yeah, that's for the obvious place for them to go, isn't it? Um, you know, that's they where... They sort of follow Be Berezovsky. Yeah, yeah, and they follow Berezovsky. And uh, that's why we've got all the Islamists of the world in Britain, because we were the, the lead agency on Operation Cyclone in the 1980s. In fact, virtually every criminal enterprise in the world has its headquarters in our, in our blessed little island, Tony. What about the suicide of Berezovsky? Well, it was, wasn't accepted as suicide by the by the coroner in uh, Buckinghamshire. Uh, they said that it was they left an open verdict, and of course he, he, he the Russians weren't accused of killing him. Uh, it was just left as an open verdict, and I suspect Berezovsky was topped by his own side by MI6 because Berezovsky kept pushing this idea: we've got to get Putin for bombing Moscow. We've got to get Putin for bombing Moscow because, of course, we're talking about the Moscow bombing, apartment bombings of of nine nine nine. Let's just I mean, have a look here because both Polonium and Novichok are supposedly. Uh, mainly produced by the Russians. So you, you, what you're saying is they, that these potentially have both been used in the Litvinenko death and this attack or, or on Sergei Skripal to make it look like the Russians have done it. Surely that's, I mean, that's too complicated. No, it's not. It's not too complicated. You've got, to, you've got to look at things. This is basically a strategy of tension. What's going on here is the population, in fact, haven't got any beef with the Russians. They don't, they don't like them or dislike them. They don't have really much feeling about them at all. So they've got to be made to feel that Russia is a threat, an enemy, and this, that, and the other, which is what this is all about. And eventually, people who are not really paying attention find themselves going along with all of this because they simply can't think of anything else to do. And that's the purpose of it. And of course, it's very dangerous because the Russians are very well aware of what's happening. They know that they're being set up. Well, but and if they, if they were less level-headed, we'd already be in a, in a full-on shooting war with them. Berezovsky died in uh, 2013. That's just about five years ago, almost exactly five years years ago. Uh, let's have a listen to what Paul Burrell had to say about this, about the Berezovsky death, because he actually was working quite closely with him. I knew Mr. Berezovsky well. I had long conversations with him. I was at Gainsborough when he had his Chechen friends there. Berezovsky was not a man who could commit suicide. His fortune was not zero. He still had about 250 to 500 million dollars. Mr. Berezovsky became dangerous. He talked too much. He took drugs that made him uncontrollable. If I understand correctly, he had become uncontrollable. He chatted right and left. The picture we saw of his death, that he hanged himself in the bathroom with a scarf, does not correspond to reality. 
That is, he was killed. Yes, he was assassinated. It was professional. But not by the Russians. Well, what, what were... OK, so why, why would the... Let's just try and dig down into this a little bit. Why would MI6 or MI5 or maybe private companies or private interests, the royal family, etc., because we know uh, the Queen's uh, cousin was also close to Berezovsky, he's a fluent Russian speaker as well. Uh, um, so what would be the motive there? Well, you've got to... Re- you've, if, I mean, he was talking very much... That's one of the things he said there. He was talking to the press all the time. Yeah, the problem with Berezovsky, he, he wanted to be president of Russia, and he and Putin worked together uh, in the in the era of the bombings of Moscow. Uh, of, yeah, well, you know, he wanted to be the power behind the scenes. Yeah, he wanted to be the power behind the scenes with Putin as, as, as his puppet, and Putin wasn't going to be his puppet. And then, of course, Berezovsky so fled to, to the West. Did he come to London? Because yeah, he fled to the West. This is the, the, the place west. where this idea of yeah. having power behind the scenes yeah, yeah. has, well, I mean, has it, been mastered. Basically, Putin kicked him out. After, after you know, they, they worked together to keep Zaya Ganov out in the uh, 1996 presidential election. Well, he was involved in the Aeroflot case, yes, and the yeah. privatisation of Aeroflot. Well, I mean, he was, one, he, was, he, was, he was a leading uh, oligarch thief, theft, uh, theft, what do you call it? Thief. Thief. <laughs> Uh, but you know, and, and, and he was the chief, and of course, Anatoly Chubais, who's still in Russia, was also heavily involved in all of this rip-off. Um, and Berezovsky and Putin fell out. Berezovsky comes to the West, and of course, he wants Putin removed. And he's, you know, that's in line with Western policy because Putin's starting to wander off the park. It, I mean, they originally thought of him as somebody who was going to be useful to them, and of course, he's turned out to have his own ideas and all the rest of it. So Berezovsky kept pushing. I mean, the, the book by Litvinenko, which nobody talks about, but the actual book was called Blowing Up Russia. And in that book, Litvinenko says, we know that Putin was involved in the bombings of the Moscow apartment blocks, because I was involved in it, and so was Berezovsky. We were all involved in it. So why don't we accuse Putin of being involved in it? Now, if you can't see what's wrong with that, you can see these people are not going to be, you know, they're, they're actually stupid. You know, you can't, you can't use it in that kind of way. And eventually, he carried on banging on about why don't we use this against Putin. And of course, you can't, because MI6 and the CIA were also uh, involved in that in that in that terrorist attack, as as they were in many others around the world, including the nine eleven attacks, which took place subsequently after the nine 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 attacks in Moscow. BCFM. Martin, we're going to talk now about Martin. We're going to talk now about we're going to talk Martin. We're going to talk now about something completely different, which is uh, Cambridge Analytica. Uh, let's have a listen now to um, what the Prime Minister's questions on Wednesday. John and Lucas, we're grateful. Revelations suggest that there is something rotten in the state of our democracy. Yeah. Current electoral law is woefully inadequate at dealing with the combination of big money and big data. So, will the Prime Minister commit to urgent cross party talks to kick start a process to ensure that we have a regulatory and legal framework that is up to the challenge of dealing with the digital age? Yeah. Can I say to the Honourable Lady, as I've said previously, clearly the allegations relating to Cambridge Analytica are concerning because people should be able to have confidence about how their personal data is, uh, is being used. I think it's right that what we're seeing is the Information Commissioner investigating this matter. I expect Facebook, Cambridge Analytica and any other others involved to cooperate fully with the Information Commissioner's office in that uh, uh, investigation that is taking place. And our Data Protection Bill, as I said earlier, will strengthen the powers of the Information Commissioner, but it will also strengthen legislation around data protection, um, be- as, will, as will the other steps the Government has taken through, for example, our Digital Charter. This is a Government that is committing to making sure that this is a safe place to be online. The only trouble is, of course, they've got no real electoral mandate to bring in any laws to do anything about the fact that the technology has run so way, way, way ahead of the electoral law, Martin. Well, indeed, and Cambridge Analytica is just the tip of the iceberg. Behind them are people like SCL that you mentioned earlier. And, uh, of course, the, there's lots of Tory party donors in there and ex-special forces and, and intelligence people. Well, a chap called we're Christopher de- dealing- Wiley appeared mm-hmm. uh, at the House of Commons this week. He used to work for Cambridge Analytica and SCL. Um, and he, I mean, this is the data mining industry. Effectively, these are the people behind Facebook. So you're doing scribbling all away on Facebook, but these people are the ones who are getting into your Facebook account finding out who your friends are, using all that information to then target messages to you through uh, bots or whatever, fake individuals on Facebook, uh, and then also to do analysis. So how do uh, people like Facebook and SCL get around 
uh, election law. Uh, Chris Wiley had quite some interesting things to say, and we have a few clips from him today uh, in the Commons this week. If you, as an investor of a company, put money as a shareholder, as an investor into that company, that's not classed as a political donation, right? That's an investment in a company that you're the owner of, right? I'm improving r and I'm, I'm expanding our teams. But you can do that more pointedly and continue to invest purposely into a company so that it can also work for particular entities at a subsidized rate or indeed in some cases for free. So one of the things that I'd also just point out is that just because there's a bill with a particular number on it with CA, it doesn't mm. mean that that's the genuine value of the work that was yeah. produced because part of the brilliance of the setup that, that Robert Mercer created was that it becomes very easy to actually get around campaign finance laws in terms of declarations because it's an investment. It, you know, He's a shareholder. He can invest. And what he's saying there, Martin, in not so many words, is, well, SCL could do the same job for the Labour Party or the Tory Party. They might charge the Labour Party £10 million to do the job and do it for free for the Tories. Well, they might, but probably, there's also a politics involved in this as well. Uh, they, 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 no doubt they do intervene in the Labour Party, but not to help them win elections, probably to help them lose them. So they can charge what they want for the services, even though they might say to one client, well, because we actually don't really like your politics, we're going to charge well, you no, ten, no, well, ten you, times more. No, well, that, that's right. And of but course, they won't say that openly. No, there, there's manipulation going on. I would suggest that there is also a strategy behind this. It's not just people making money on the sly. There's also a strategy. These people, there's a revolving door between this kind of uh, Cambridge Analytica world and the secret services and, uh, and the wealthy well, Tory donors. We're, com- we're coming to that. Very good, Martin. <laughs> ten out of ten. Uh, but first, we'll have a look at the the action of companies like SCL, Strategic Communication Labs, as a, a kind of modern colonialism. Part of the business model of SCL is to capture a government, uh, so win an election. You get paid for that, but you don't make a ton of money. Where you actually make money is then going to the minister and introducing the minister to a company and then making deals, I, I remember deals, there were different um, companies that were interested in building you know, new ports or things like that, and in order to get a competitive advantage, if some money goes here, then some money goes here, and then you can introduce the minister, and if the minister then approves the project, then you get a cut of that deal. For example, when I was there, it wasn't just selling influence from a company to a government, often, they would use fake government projects to also then help support the political aims of of the the minister. So, for example, Alexander Nix met with the Minister of Health of Ghana and offered her to provide her with a large degree of political and campaign services, but they would bill it through the Ministry of Health as a health research program. And so they approved that. I've also sent documentation to the committee on this. And so, so can I just stop you? Earlier you referred to some of these very wealthy people involved in these companies. Do you think this is really what are driving forces, that they can be big power players on the world stage? Yeah, you can be like a colonial master in a country. Sorry, not to sound flippant about it, but it, 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 is, it felt very much like a privatized colonizing operation. You'd go into a country that has underdeveloped civic institutions, you would exploit that and then make money off of it. And that's how they make a lot of their money, through exploiting relationships and the fact that there's not a lot of oversight in, and government accountability in a lot of these countries. So it's very easy to make money off of that. The key, the key thing is you have to have your guy in power first. Well, that's very interesting, and it ties with what I, my own research and the sort of things I know from the outside. Um, uh, you know, as you know, we, we spoke to British Army Psychological Warfare some years ago, who's got his own firm operating in this world, and that's what goes on. Elections are not just free and fair, where people just go to the He's ballot box the and leaders. so on. He's talking about the leaders as puppets, effectively. Of these well, they are, but I mean, if you're if you're a small p- p- poverty-stricken country like Malawi, and somebody turns up with a b- b- big multinational organisation like SCL with loads of co- uh, multinational contacts, you're, you're easy you're easy meat, especially. If 
if you've got people in charge who just want to line their own pockets. Also very good easily hear, bribed, don't also they? Also very good to hear this week uh, the mention of Palantir, uh, whose uh, software is used by uh, Western governments. It's basically a Bilderberg company. Uh, they're uh, in attendance there. They're financed uh, through Peter Thiel, who's the inventor or the, the main man behind PayPal. He was one of the original financiers of Facebook in the first place. Um, and so what about this relationship between Facebook and these companies? Because a lot of the information they're getting is through Facebook, isn't it? And we've heard just this week, um, there's a, and I'll put an article up on our show page, that uh, Facebook has been taking, basically when they come into your mobile phone, the Facebook app is sucking out all of your private personal information, including text messages, including contents of emails, uh, including your entire contacts book, and then selling it on to the, the, the highest bidder. Well, they're not just selling it on; they're also passing it to the security services just for free. Well, uh, because well, they, that's, they have because a financial that's what, relationship with this. Well, with yeah, people like the NSA. exactly. I and mean, uh, 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 these big conglomerates in social media have been allowed to develop and encouraged to develop by the intelligence services as a means of social control. So and it's that's, a bit that's like what's being exposed. Facebook here. is the public face of Big Brother. Indeed. And of course, in Big, in Big Brother in, in 1984, uh, the government imp- uh, you know, gave everybody a television, the television watched them. Now we're actually openly, people go out and buy new phones to give their information to the CIA and anybody who wants it. And they even pay good money for it. Well, they've also said in the Snowden it? leaks, they said that the Samsung TVs were actually spying on people exactly like they said in 1984. Anyway, let's go on to listen to a bit more from the fascinating Christopher Wiley, where he talks here about the role of Palantir, uh, because to me, the Cambridge Analytica is, is really just to focus on the Trump and the Brexit election. Much, much deeper is Palantir and SCL. Much of the, the attention, quite rightly, is on Cambridge Analytica at the moment. Do you know other data analytics companies out there who are operating in the same way? When I first joined SCL, one of the very first emails that I got was asking me about a company called Palantir. So I'm not sure if people are familiar with Palantir, but it's a private contractor. Its largest client is the NSA. It also works for GCHQ. Alexander Nix was very interested in the work that Palantir did, in part because Sophie Schmidt, who is the daughter of Eric Schmidt, the chairman of Google, worked for Alexander Nix before I came on board and introduced him to Palantir. So when I came on, one of the very first questions was, can we do something with Palantir? Can we do something with Palantir? What do you think about Palantir? So we actually had several meetings with Palantir whilst I was there. Some of the documentation I've also provided to the committee, and there is more documentation that I still need to provide you on this, but Palantir, there were senior Palantir employees who were also working on the Facebook data. Okay. Thank you. Can I just clarify one point? That was not an official contract between Palantir and Cambridge Analytica but there were Palantir staff who would come into the office and work on the data. And we would go and meet with with Palantir staff at Palantir. So just to clarify, Palantir didn't officially contract with Cambridge Analytica, but there were Palantir staff who helped build the models uh, that we were working on. So how does that work, Martin, where you've got people from Palantir actually in their offices working with them, exchanging data and information, no contract, no money, Pal changes hands. All, well, all totally on word mouth. Well, that's called uh, plausible deniability, isn't it? There's no, there's, no, there's no paper trail. Interesting. OK, so finally, uh, Christopher Wiley talks about this uh, company called Black Cube. Uh, what I'll do is I'll put a link on our show page to the full interview. It's quite long. But, it's, I mean, it's actually loads of fascinating stuff in here that really tells us how the world really works. Great little revelation for Good Friday. But this is where he talks about the, the role of Israeli intelligence and also this company, Black Cube. Do you think that, Mr Mercer, should be subject to investigation absolutely, itself? Absolutely, absolutely. And, with regard and to intimidation. And it's not, just, it's not just legal intimidation, right? This company uses firms like Black Cube. And I'd encourage you to talk to Channel 4 to actually watch the footage of Alexander Nix talking about Black Cube because they weren't, unfortunately, able to air it. But yeah. that's an intimidating firm. If you work with Black Cube, that's an intimidating firm. Right. Something to say about the Nigeria Project is... I got incredibly panicked 
phone calls from people. Because the relationship with one of the funders turned sour, several people were threatened with their lives and they had to immediately leave the country. My predecessor was found dead. One of my other co-workers had a massive head injury and is missing part of his skull. People do get hurt at this firm. And given that they, they work with, you know, Israeli private intelligence firms who are willing to do essentially whatever it is that you want them to do if you pay them. This is why so many people that, for example, Carol has talked talk to are genuinely afraid to come forward to talk about the firm because it's that intimidating. Black Cube. So what's the role of these private Israeli intelligence firms? Well, and, so- and why is it that his predecessor might have been found dead? Well, I, mean, I don't know the particular circumstances that he's talking about, but ICTS, a, a, a Mossad-linked intelligence co- co- corporation, uh, is in charge of uh, the uh, security at all of the airports on 9-11, of Schiphol Airport, where both the underpants bomber and the shoe bomber got on a plane without being properly checked. The fact that, the, that this world is out there, and it's a very, very vicious world, and uh, and it's, there's, there's lots of murder and assassination well, goes Edward on in it. Well, Snowden talked about this, didn't he? To NBC in 2014, he said British spies have developed dirty tricks for use against nations, hackers, terror groups, suspected criminals and arms dealers that include releasing computer viruses, spying on journalists and diplomats, jamming phones and computers and using sex to lure targets into honey traps. That's documents taken from the National Security Agency by Edward Snowden. And they also include murder, of course, which is why, of course, it's perfectly feasible if you're an independent police officer to assume that the main suspect in the script poisoning case must be MI6 because we've got a track record of doing exactly this thing Snowden, over many years. Snowden uh, talked about techniques developed by a British secret British spy unit called the Joint Threat Research and Intelligence Group, JTRIG, as part of a growing mission to go on offence and attack adversaries ranging from Iran to the hacktivists of Anonymous. According to the documents which came from presentations prepared in 2010 and 2012 for the NSA Cyber Spy Conference the agency's goal was to destroy, deny, degrade and disrupt enemies by discrediting them, planting mal- m- misinformation and shutting down their communications. Yes, and therefore, th- since we know that that's what they do, and there's no dispute about it, they even boast about it. I mean, the next Mossad guy boasted about the 2,500 killings Mossad had carried out in a recent book. We perhaps put a link up to that. The fact is that they, uh, when they're talking amongst themselves, they even boast about what they do. And then, of course, they say, well, we couldn't possibly have killed Skripal because we don't do stuff like that, except that you do, and that you've been doing it for, th- for decades. That book's called Rise and Kill First, and we'll be doing something about that next week. BCFM. Now, Martin, Manchester attack firefighters did not respond to the bombing for two hours because of a false alarm over an active shooter. Well, I don't know what happened there, but it's very suspicious, the isn't p- it? Somebody lied, surely. There was well, no it active could be, shooter. It could, mm, yes, well, it could be. And that- they kept, the, for two hours, all these firefighters uh, who are first responders were kept away, and people would have died as a mm. result, almost certainly. Mm-hmm. And also, as you know, there were eyewitnesses that there was more than one person involved. The firefighters were fuming, by mm-hmm. the way. Yeah. They were waiting to do their job, and they were told by some idiotic senior officer, sit down and do nothing. Well, as you know, we've got eyewitnesses who said there was potentially more than one person involved. The other thing about that, of course, is that the the, 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 the patsy or the victim or the, the perpetrator turned out to be linked to the Islamic fighting group, which, of course, has got intimate links with MI6 going back 30 or 40 years. Now, in 2010, there was a similar sort of incident over in New Zealand at Pike River Mine. Uh, this is a mining disaster where the mining rescue service were told, you're not allowed to go in and try and rescue anybody. Well, I had a chat to when I was over in New Zealand to a guy called Jacob Cohen who wrote a book, Murder at Pike River Mine, all about this. And it turns out that this was quite deliberate, that they didn't want the people rescued. Hello, um, Dr Jacob Cohen. I wrote a short book about the terrible mining disaster in New Zealand, Friday the 9th of November 2010. Now, Pike River Mine was where the disaster took place. Actually, the news went all around the world in 2010 about this disaster. Just remind us. The news story was that there were uh, 29 miners killed in the mine. The coal mine that blew up, uh, it was a highly gassed mine. Yeah, they wouldn't allow any rescue team in to rescue the miners. It's a coal mine. So um, 
when I saw what had happened and that the police were immediately brought in, I became suspicious, did a few inquiries, and then realised it was a big cover-up. And so as a result, decided to write a book about it. Well, well done for doing that, because it doesn't seem like any of the national press in New Zealand really looked into this case. Tell us when you first realised that there was some kind of cover-up about whether there was any possibility of rescuing those who were under the ground. Well, actually, almost immediately, the first reports on television showed an interview with one of the parents of one of the miners that was in the, in the mine, a chap called Laurie Drew, and he actually said, being interviewed on television, that he believed there was a cover-up taking place. So how long into the disaster was that? Probably a day or two. So the police were brought in, stopped any rescue attempt, which immediately became suspicious. Usually when a mine like this blows up, the methane gas is all burnt up in the explosion and there's a window of opportunity for the rescuers to go in to rescue anybody that's left alive when they didn't do that. So who, who would be normally doing this rescue? Special mine rescue teams. If a mine rescue team can't go in, into a mine to rescue people, what, what's the point of it? Well, exactly, and it's not normal practice to bring the police in to take over the situation and stop rescuers going in. Uh, this is done in China, incidentally, in many situations in China, to cover up for big companies. So who was this guy that was arrived on the scene and, and sort of decided to take over? Superintendent Gary Knowles. He uh, was formerly head of police intelligence, I think, for the South Pacific. He was brought in highly suspicious to start off with. Tell us what you discovered in your book. Well, I discovered after doing research that the Friday before the explosion, the company had taken out a $100 million insurance in case the mine blew up. The mine was running at a loss, terrible loss. It was in the interests of the major shareholders and directors to deliberately blow the mine up. You're saying this is possibly an insurance job? Well, it's partly an insurance job, but then in the background there was another company, an Australian company called Bathurst, Bathurst Resources Limited, that was earmarked to take over all of New Zealand's coal mining interests in the background, and they wanted to close... Pike River mine down and turn the public's attitude away from underground mining to support open cast mining that would be carried out by Bathurst Resources Limited. I mean, isn't that the norm around the world now, open cast rather than the old fashioned mines where you dig a shaft down? That is the norm, which they've never really told anybody. Pike River had very high quality medical coal in the mine that was very valuable. Just a minute, what is medical coal? Well, it's used in medical equipment, car emission systems, you know, carbon filters, all that sort of thing. Yeah, it's very valuable. That's one reason why they wanted to get at it. How I found what was going on, I went into Bathurst Resources Limited website. Because it's an Australian public company, any major change in shareholding has to be listed on the company's website. I then looked at the major changes leading up to the explosion and found Bank of America had been aggressively buying up shares in Bathurst Resources. And it just so happens that the New Zealand Prime Minister, John Key, had previously worked for Bank of America prior to becoming a New Zealand Prime Minister, which is a remarkable coincidence. Well, was he involved in appointing this uh, policeman to take over? As far as I'm aware, Bathurst Resources had made a memorandum of understanding with Stemcor Australia Limited, another company that exports most of Australia's coal, to actually take over and export most of New Zealand's coal as well. Now, Stemcor Australia Limited is the private family firm of the Oppenheimers in London. So that's how insidious it becomes. So we're talking about nearly 30 people lost their lives. Has there been any signs of, uh, other than you were talking about on the television, of the families of the victims of this disaster getting annoyed? Well, of course, all the victims' families are, are terribly annoyed, as I predicted in my book. In fact, the British government and in the British Commonwealth for centuries have used royal commissions of inquiry to cover up for government and corporate fraud and that they would establish a Royal Commission of Inquiry, as they did do, collected all of the evidence, and then, at the end of inquiry, embargoed that evidence for 75 years, so nobody could bring any private prosecution against any of the directors or people involved. 
Uh, has there been any real inquiry, either by specific individual journalists here in New Zealand or any of the major newspapers, the Herald, for example? No, none of this. There have been a couple of books written about it, but hiding the real truth. Nothing has been in the major newspapers on the media about about my book, totally censored. Yeah, and that's it. People have wanted or tried to bring actions against the directors and uh, uh, shareholders. However, when it get, goes to court, because all the evidence has now been embargoed, such as Peter Whittle, the chief executive at the time, his lawyers just go to court and say, well, my, that their client can't defend himself if all the evidence has been embargoed and he's got no access to the evidence. Case dismissed. And that's, uh, you know, a trick that's used. OK, so what would you like people to know that, as part of this evidence, that legal tricks have been used to shut down? Well... This has been very, in New Zealand, it's been a very emotional issue. A new Labour government that's in power now has set up um, an agency uh, to look into re-entry into the mine. Uh, they'll so make... has nobody been in there since at all? No. No, so they, the bodies will still be in there? The bodies are still in there. They have uh, bored uh, one or two holes down, sent cameras down the holes, and I have been told that they've They've found bodies there, but that information has been kept from the public. Uh, a lot of the families think that there were a number of them in the mine waiting to be rescued at a rescue station, but nobody turned up. And so, so the mine actually has specific places that people involved in these accidents can go to with the hope and expectation that someone will be down there to, to get them out with oxygen yeah. or whatever. Yeah, there's an, a, a, an assembly area in the mine where rebreathers ox oxygen equipment was where if anyone had been alive that they would have assembled. The families are sure that there were people in the mine. In fact, somebody apparently made a phone call from inside the mine outside because the outside telephone system was still working. And that's all been hushed up. And most of this evidence has been supplied to the Royal Commission, which has now been embargoed for 75 years. Well, I'm giving you the chance now to break that embargo and to make sure that anyone with an interest in this accident uh, is able to know a few, at least key facts that can help maybe, even if it's uh, to launch legal actions, to, to break that embargo so the public does find out what's going on. Under New Zealand law, as long as all that evidence collected by the Royal Commission is embargoed, it's virtually impossible for anybody to actually charge anybody because anyone that's charged can't get access to any evidence to defend themselves. So it's very clever. The new body that's looking into a re-entry and will make advice to the government by the end of this term of the existing Labour government... They've allocated about $24 million for this investigation. I think uh, it's my own view is that they won't enter the mine. At the end of this period, they'll come up, they say they've researched everything, and in their opinion, it's just too dangerous to re-enter the mine. So what, what excuses were given, and I have to use that word excuses, really, uh, for the mine rescue people to be held back from going in to the mine in the first place by this police officer. Maybe you can just remind us of his name. Uh, Superintendent Gary Knowles. Yeah, well, the excuse generally given by the government's experts, which is contrary to the family's experts, and I might say the family have got international mining experts, is that it's too unsafe to enter the mine because of the high levels of methane gas. However, they now have sophisticated oxygen rebreathing equipment where rescuers can go into highly gassed mines and I think the rebreathers last up to 12 hours, 10 or 12 hours. So there's I'm no just, excuse. I'm amazed, really, that, uh, I mean, for example, the mine rescue people and the uh, uh, victims' families, are they, have they had any communication with each other about uh, comparing notes? Yeah, the families have formed a group and um, they're well aware of the corruption behind what's happened, but it's uh, very difficult for them. As I say, how can you take a person to court if you can't get hold of the evidence? So what advice would you have for uh, anyone who's taken an interest in this to find out more, other than, I suppose, to read your book? Well, that's right. All the families on the west coast of the South 
well, all the families and a lot of people, including members of the police force, that are unhappy with what's happened. Uh, so much so that uh, anonymous members of the police force have sent key evidence on flash drives, a remote hard drive of video material and uh, a lot of the secret evidence that has been embargoed to members of the families. So that's how strongly people feel, even within the New Zealand police. So not all the New Zealand police are corrupt. Do you think that this ultimately was a cover-up which was orchestrated and a potential murder scene that was orchestrated from within or from outside New Zealand? I actually think it's from outside New Zealand that the, the chief executive and directors of Pike River Mine were involved, but other companies and major shareholders were involved as well, and directors of those companies. Um, it, it's such a delicate situation because they also have cross shareholdings and other big companies, so it becomes a really complex situation. But it's all about multinationals taking over the coal and mineral resources of each country. Yep. Where would you like to see arrests made and people interviewed to get the actual evidence to start to move this forward? And I'm thinking really uh, a, a, for, to a resolution and justice for the families of those lost loved ones. The government and the justice system, through royal commissions of inquiry or whatever, should not be allowed to embargo key evidence uh, required for any court trial. Or you know what, it reminds me a little bit actually of the inquiry done in the UK into the death of Dr David Kelly. He was the government scientist that died in 2003 in very suspicious circumstances. Many people believe he was murdered in the run-up to the Iraq war because he was saying that the government was fitting up a case basically to fitting Saddam Hussein up and that there was no real excuse for war and he said this on live on Radio 4. He was one of the top government scientists and uh, within a, uh, a few days he was found dead in the woods in Oxfordshire and again an inquiry was done into that and then it was in em embargoed I think in that case for 80 years before that inquiry could ever be made public. I mean it doesn't seem that there's any point in doing these inquiries if they're then going to be covered by the Official Secrets Act or something similar for decades to come. In fact until everybody who was involved potentially in the cover up, in the murder has passed away and can escape justice. Yes, well, this is a standard practice worldwide in the, in the Commonwealth of Nations. Well, the Queen is still at the head of our government here. This system, uh, Royal Commissions of Inquiries, have been used for centuries to cover up fraud, government and corporate fraud. In the United States, the classic excuse is national security national security so if they want to hide anything if the government wants to keep evidence hidden the excuse is always no it's national security actually i would suggest it's really much more embarrassment political embarrassment and the fact that you might lose the next election if the truth comes out uh, and that's why we're doing this interview today can you just remind me again of your name and the date of the uh, publication the title of your book about the pike river mine disaster the book is Murder at Pike River Mine, second edition is the best one, Dr Jacob Kahn, and it was published on December the 24th, 2010. Interesting, isn't it, Martin, where they're in this situation where the emergency services simply just don't do anything, and in, in that case it's pretty clear that uh, the, uh, the company that owned the mine had decided it wasn't profitable, they wanted to close it down, uh, and they weren't interested in any evidence being gathered that implicated them in the disaster. Well, it's, uh, the whole thing is a scam in which 30 people were murdered, effectively. And uh, that's the sort of world we live in, and that's the way the world works. And then people think, well, we wouldn't, uh, you know, the British government wouldn't go around killing people like Skripal. It's absurd. Of course they would. That's the sort of people they are. BCFM. Now on to near-death experiences. Uh, we're going to hear now from one man who says he died uh, for two hours. In fact, the documentation that he's got s explains that the hospital did say he died for two hours. Uh, his name is Dean Braxton. Uh, but the question is, of course, what did he see when he died? Sorry about that, Martin. But while I'm finding the right clip there, can you... <laughs> this show just died, folks. Hey, uh, uh, can you just uh, tell us what you make of this whole thing of near-death experiences? 
Well, I, I don't know enough about it to have a strong opinion, Tony. I'm a political analyst. Near-death experience is not really my, uh, my forte. Um, I think we're probably programmed to have some kind of uh, extreme experiences at that point, point of our lives, let's whatever have, let's happens have a next. Let's now what Dean Braxton had to say. When I got there, the Holy Spirit didn't jump out of me and say, i got to go back and get somebody else. You literally have the Holy Spirit with you for eternity. You will never not have God on the inside of you. Wow, that's cool. Most people don't even come to that understanding that God Almighty, He that created everything, lives on the inside even of you. Even when you're in heaven, you'll be full oh, of the Holy you, Spirit. You will be full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be inside of you. I tell people this a lot of times because people say to me, I want to get closer to God. And I say this to them, Dean, God is on the inside of you. How much closer can you get? We don't think that way. So that's where the Holy Spirit is. He's on the inside of you. When you get there, everyone has the Holy Spirit, God Almighty, living on the inside of them. And there's Jesus, and he was there, okay? I tell people Jesus was uh, 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock to the left of me. I was on my hands and knees giving him praise. You know what he was doing when I, when, when I got there? He was strategizing. What do you mean? He was literally, literally coming up with plans on how to move certain areas literally on this planet and in heaven to get more people to know him as Lord and Savior. It's not a, 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 a random like, oh, it might just happen. And you know how it's moved? He's moved by our prayers. Prayers have substance. When so that's Dean Braxton there. Um, thank you very much for uh, time to sign off now for the Murdoch News at 8. Thanks to our guest in the first hour, political activist Katie Finnegan Clark, also told Labour Oxford economist Martin Summers. Do please join us for the politics show at 6 o'clock next week. God bless over the Easter holiday and don't let the banksters get you down. This is Bristol's BCFM on 93.2, online and on your mobile. BCFM is an award-winning community radio station for Bristol, bringing you national news on the hour, live from the Sky News Centre.